going to move to our second year residents. Julia Bird is going to talk to us about corneal incisions with a new diamond keratome. Dr. Bird. All right. Thank you, guys. So I have no financial disclosures. I'm going to go through, um, this is kind of the second part of a study that Russell presented last year, but I'll go through some background and why this came about, go through some of the methods and results from the study last year that was already completed, and then talk about what we've done with this new um, edge strength resistance study, and then talk about uh, the QI project I've been involved in as well. So uh, sutureless clear corneal incisions um, kind of came about in trying to figure out you know, ways to make cataract surgery more efficient, and um, you know, there's some advantages to doing the clear corneal incisions, which include a decreased corneal astigmatism, decreased cost if you're not suturing every single incision that can be uh, beneficial. When people get really proficient at this, the ease of creating the, the incision um, you know, is really important and you can become much more um, efficient at doing this. But as this, uh, <coughs> this technique has kind of evolved, people have started to question or just look at some disadvantages for doing these incisions and looking at the question of wound leak and postoperative hypotony that causes potentially an influx of fluid into the eye, which potentially can increase the rate of endophthalmitis. And with these incisions, there is some variabilities in wound architecture and size. Um, so thinking about postoperative endophthalmitis, you know, it's not super common, so studies depends on how many, you need a huge patient population to really get good rates, and so rates of endophthalmitis vary depending on, you know, how many people are studied and what the, where the location was, lots of variables, but rates have been reported between 0.07 and 0.093 percent of cases, um, and, you know, variations in that range. But there have been reports of increasing rates of endophthalmitis and it, between 2000 and 2003, and at least not any significant decrease in the rates. And granted, there's so many different variables that do play into this, and so you couldn't necessarily pinpoint, you know, the incision as the only variable. And so, of course, people have looked at lots of other things, and you know, using um, prophylactic antibiotics. Uh, cameral, intracameral antibiotics and all these things are important, but um, kind of our focus will be on how we can kind of maximize the safety of these incisions and the clear corneal incisions. So just as a few background studies, there was a really large um, <coughs> study done by a group out of Japan that was a prospective uh, case control study that they took. They were comparing both the um, type of IOL that was placed in addition to the type of incision that was made, but they found a statistical significance in their clear corneal incision versus scleral corneal incision groups with a 0.29 percent rate in the corneal clear corneal incision group in 2003. Um, another large retrospective comparative case control study looked at 38 cases of endophthalmitis um, and 45 percent of them were clear corneal incisions versus um, 55 percent being scleral tunnel incisions, and in that study there was a three-fold risk of endophthalmitis in controlling for these other things with the clear corneal incision. Uh, a study that came out of the Moran um, in 2005 was a retrospective cohort study, which looked, tried to look at all these different variables and assess the odds ratio of postoperative endophthalmitis. And in that, this study, the biggest risk factor that they found was a wound leak on postoperative day one. So the idea is that this wound leak potentially causes hypotony, which can cause um, fluid to come into the eye and that contaminates things. And of course, it, it is still somewhat of a speculation of the mechanism. I don't think we've specifically prove that that can happen, and there have been lots of studies that have looked at, you know, measuring IOP in that early postoperative period to do, to prove that it's hypotony and kind of looking at that, but these models are all difficult to kind of create a realistic model, and also endophthalmitis isn't common, isn't very common, so studying it, of course, you need these huge, um, huge groups of patients. Um, and then, 
So that is kind of the post-operative endophthalmitis and the theories and the reasons why maybe people are, why you could potentially think a clear corneal incision would have at least a small, uh, slightly elevated risk of getting uh, endophthalmitis. Um, in terms of the wound architecture, there was a study, this doesn't exactly apply to the clear corneal incisions, but in terms of the scleral corneal incisions and the tunnel incisions, um, this group looked at the square incisions versus rectangular incisions and just showed that with external pressure, the square incisions were much more robust in terms of um, preventing leaking. And that concept has kind of been transferred over and brought forward to this idea of wound architecture and how to create the wound that would be the most resistant to external forces and wound, leak and wound leaks. Um, with the diamond keratome, there is a little bit less control even in terms of the tilt and how you are entering the eye. You kind of have to be very precise in order to create this perfectly square incision. And then the other kind of thing that has come up in creating these wounds is even if you have a square incision, if it's not the correct size or it's, there's some problem with it, you can stretch it and then even that will, I mean, that will be a risk factor as well to not being very well self-sealing and have problems with post-operative wound leaks. Um, so looking through the literature, people try to create situations to uh, mimic, you know, the real life, and it's always interesting to, figure, to see how people decide to uh, simulate these situations. Um, a Sam Maskett and group in 2013 used this force gauge to try to simulate kind of patient-induced manipulation of the eye with pressure, and they calibrated their gauge to just do one, to administer one ounce of external force. They first did this on healthy eyes, not undergoing surgery, and they showed an IOP increase um, that they felt was consistent with kind of the literature of what should happen with the um, external force, and they calibrated their force right after po cataract surgery, and they were more looking at stromal hydration versus sutures and looking at the rate of leakage. So that's just one way people have kind of tried to um, have a model for the real life of patient rubbing their eyes and having these different types of incisions. So with the traditional diamond keratome, like I mentioned, the keratome tilt can really change the architecture of the wound and potentially make it less robust. Um, conjunctival entry can cause conjunctival ballooning and cause problems and difficulty intraoperatively. And then wound tears, where the tear, wound tears out um, at the edges <coughs> if after manipulation during surgery can also cause problems and potentially lead to postoperative um, wound leaks. So Dr. Olson designed this new keratome blade. And <coughs> the idea is that the cutting edges are really isolated to the um, anterior part of the blade and so that there is less kind of risk of the wound tilt or um, and there's more stability and kind of safety with this blade that, and at least that was kind of the theory. So the outer cutting edge is only for the first 200 microns and then the rest of the outer edge is completely smooth and round and then the majority of the cutting comes from this blade here. Um, the other thing to note is that he, there is also a measurement line at two millimeters to mark where the wound or where you should actually enter the eye. So in the first part of the study, um, the traditional diamond keratome was compared to this new blade to compare consistency and kind of um, consistency between wounds and squareness and uh, if it, to see if there was any difference in that. So. Dr. Swan, Dr. Bettis, and I um, all did uh, incisions with these different wounds. We marked, or with the different blades, we marked the wound with um, <coughs> some marking dye. And basically, we did find statistical significance for having more consistency between the edges of one and two, meaning kind of more consistently a square incision versus the diamond keratome where there were more um, kind of there's more asymmetry between one and two. Um, another kind of side note is that there is kind of this lip that forms um, with the new diamond keratome versus, and that is almost like um, an A 
versus a V that forms with the diamond keratome or the traditional diamond keratome. And, you know, in clinical practice, that might have pretty significant repercussions for how easy it is to hydrate a, a wound um, with the kind of A flap. But that was just something we noted. And I think it has to do with how you're engaging the blade. And if you don't engage it all the way, it can kind of change that lip shape as well. So then the other thing that wasn't, that we did note last year, but didn't find statistical significance was that the rate of, tra or the year of training was correlated, but not statistically with um, kind of an improved ability to use the new keratome. So maybe extrapolating that this is a potentially a better blade to use at first where you, there's kind of more built-in safety mechanisms and the skill of keeping that blade completely parallel and flat and not tilting it um, is something that maybe could come later. So, so in conclusion from that first part of the study, the new keratome did create more consistent and symmetric wounds. Um, there weren't a lot of tear outs just from doing the initial wounds, but there were two with the traditional, one with the new keratome. Of course, the limitations are that this is not a realistic situation. The eyes were not filled with OVD, they were immobile, they were cadaverized. But then the question is, okay, so we have this wound that is more consistently symmetric. Does that have any real life implications and does that matter? And the challenge of that is actually creating and designing a study that can appropriately answer that question. So for the second part, the objective was to evaluate if these square and consistent incisions actually translated to an increased incision edge tear resistance, which again is maybe hard to translate completely to clinical setting, but you know, while you're intraoperatively um, manipulating the wound, there are some forces there, and so the idea is to try to kind of um, simulate that environment. <laughs> so for the methods, 20 incisions with each type of blade um, are made on different eyes, and they're human cadaver eyes, again, from the San Diego Eye Bank, so there's variability in kind of health of the eye and time to collection and time for us using them. The Mandel eye mount is used to stabilize the eye and bring it to a normal or a physiologic pressure between 20 and 30. And then the diamond keratome, the new design, and then the standard designs are used to create the incisions. Um, and so with the diamond keratome, like I referenced before, you do have to the entry and the way that you're actually making the wound is different. And so I think that's kind of part of the problem if you've been using the diamond keratome a lot before. But you have to enter the, the tip has to be perpendicular to the corneal surface at about 45 degrees to the limbus. And then both tips have to be engaged in the stroma. And then once they're completely engaged, you can angle parallel to the stroma and then enter when you reach that mark and into the anterior chamber. So <laughs> to try to measure the strain, the kind of edge resistance, this um, strain gauge was modified and kind of, um, I guess, the point was made so it could fit into the incisions. And it was introduced into the incision, and the central scleral side of the incision was grasped um, with a 0.3 tooth forceps, and then pressure was applied to that incision, and with <coughs> under my a microscope, we evaluated when the incision edge tear took place and stopped the pressure at that point, and then also um, noted which side or if both sides had tear outs. And then the person doing the measuring of the strain gauge was blinded. So, um, so we have some negative data here <laughs> to present. They actually are not, so they were not significantly different. We're only at 12 eyes, because as you guys just saw, Russell is in Nepal. But um, the traditional diamond keratome uh, wounds were about 245 was kind of the mean strength there. And then in the new diamond keratome design, it was 236, and definitely not significantly different. Um, and so we're still going to finish that, but I don't know, based on this preliminary data, that it will be significantly different. The new blade actually did have more tear outs on both sides, so that's measuring kind of each edge here versus the traditional on one side. Um, 
And so I think this project kind of demonstrates the, or brings a lot of challenges to light in terms of trying to design a situation that is realistic but is safe. And I, you know, this is certainly not realistic in terms of intraoperative cataract surgery, but I guess the question is, with using the strain gauge and measuring the wounds in this way, is that really clinically important? And um, how does that really impact, you know, postoperative endophthalmitis rates? Um, there's lots of variabilities. It, we felt like some of the time, the pressure from the posterior lip, and it was very hard to kind of control how much pressure you were just isolating to using the strain gauge, and that could potentially uh, change the results. And then the cadavers are variable in terms of their age and how, you know, any corneal diseases and how old the eyes are, and that definitely could potentially change the results as well. And then it was a little hard to know the very, you know, exactly when the tear out occurred, and so there was potentially some times where the tear outs maybe weren't identified um, quite as fast. So conclusion, in this specific study of this wound, there's, there wasn't any difference in the strength resistance between the two blades. Um, I think there's definitely further m routes to go to studying it in terms of, you know, clinically looking at OCT wound architecture and looking at postoperative wound leaks. Um, also, I mean, it, the other kind of maybe more important way to <coughs> investigate this question, too, is external force causing wound leaks rather than this internal, kind of a lot of internal force going on that uh, lip of the wound. So of course, we'll want to thank Dr. Olson, Dr. Swan, and Dr. Bettis, and then Dr. Zog for getting us all the eyes from the San Diego Eye Bank. Um, and now I'll move on to just address the quality improvement project that I've worked on at the VA. So the VA Glaucoma Clinic for us residents can be, um, it is an experience and sometimes better than others, but it's really can be very busy and it's just difficult to feel like you're providing the appropriate care that the patients deserve sometimes because of the overload of patients and then also though the information that we have available to us and sometimes the very um, kind of cumbersome way to retrieve the information. At the VA, I think most of us go there, but the, it is an electronic medical record, but our ophthalmology notes are still scanned. And so to look through past history, you kind of have to pull up each individual scanned note, and it's, it takes a lot of time. So it's really not um, reasonable to do that for every patient who's coming through every time you're seeing them starting from scratch. So that was kind of the, the reason <laughs> this product quality improvement project came about. Um, so we felt like if we created a new template for glaucoma history, it would really improve not only clinical efficiency, but also improve the accuracy and complete, completeness of the medical records and really improve the care that the patients are receiving because then we can know what treatments have been tried and you know what drops did or didn't work and when they presented and really kind of even know what type of glaucoma they have. And so lots of details that currently kind of get lost in the in the you know flow of things. So the deliverables are the CPRS glaucoma history note, um, and then really it's just applies to the uh, Salt Lake VA clinic and We've started, it's a slow process because the clinics are very busy, but kind of going through, especially for the really complicated patients, and going through the process of trying to retrieve all of the old notes and information and kind of put their history together. So I've worked with this on it with Brian Stagg, Chris Conradi, and myself. These are my references. All right, any questions or comments? <laughs> What's our next step? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we still need to have more of them completed. Um, I don't know, in terms of like actually, are you asking about like how to just see how well we've done with it or if it's changing, kind of well, looking yeah. at outcomes research? Yeah, so I mean, with yeah. the first is Dr. Joseph or Judith Warner, is there a few items, but um, part of the you know, what we do on a regular day-to-day -day basis is we see problems we try to make them better. Mm -hmm. um, where, where QI comes in, 
to add structure and then the second back end of it actually, you know, best case scenario measuring impact, mm -hmm. uh, at the very least, uh, just following up in this. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's kind of my next question. Yeah, so I was keeping track of what was missing. Um, like, for instance, a lot of patients who come to the glaucoma clinic just haven't had a dilated exam in, like, years because that's just not something that's documented and brought forward. So I think keeping track of that and compiling that data of, well, now we have this here, and then looking and seeing in the new patients that we're seeing if that, if they're kind of on target with what we would want them to do. But that was the best measurable way, but I know it's difficult. But it was difficult to think of a way to quantify this because in terms of clinic efficiency and time and everything, that was, it's hard. So I, I, yeah. <laughs> so I actually had the same thought, Jeff. You know, I mean, this could be, it's a nice um, quality, it's a nice QI project, mm -hmm. but you could actually, I don't know how you're going to follow it quantitatively, yeah. but you could follow it qualitatively right. and do surveys. You could look at now, and then when you put a new system, you know, when we improve the template or improve the way we yeah. do following, does it help patients well or make them happier? Does it make the text happier? Right. I mean, at least that's some quality. That's true. Yeah, that, I, yeah, I think that would be one way to look at it. I think the, the best way I had thought, which isn't from a patient perspective, but was more from just the, do we have all the information? Yes. And how many times are we having to like go back through and we don't know what type of glaucoma they have or they weren't goniode in the last year? So that was kind of what, I, what I've been doing and compiling that information. But, but that doesn't really hit the efficiency side of it, so I think you're right with that. Going to your wound architecture, yeah. that's an interesting topic that we don't pay much, much yeah. attention to. In fact, uh, Paul Ernest was our honored guest at the ACRS this year, and so when you get old enough, we can make you an honored guest. But uh, one of the ways you may want to look at it, I know it's probably too late because you're already in the study, have you thought of looking at the wound architecture with OCT? Yeah, and that's kind of would be the next step and not moving out of the cadaver world and moving into the, yeah. But that was one of the things we've talked about with Dr. Olson. I think that would be a good next move. You yeah. could also um, work with bioengineer and do a lot of modeling, computational modeling. Yeah. And that'll tell you the forces and what the variability is, the extreme. And a little more precise. A little tricky. <laughs> One comment about the wound architecture study yeah. too. Where I trained, we were not allowed to do single blade incisions. Okay. Uh, for clear point incision, yeah. we had to do a step groove, a pocket with a crescent, and then a keratome to enter. And maybe that's some things that we can share from scleral tunnel incisions. That there's right. a tri as much as possible, we're trying to create a triplanar incision. It would be interesting to see a comparison of triplanar corner incisions versus just standard two step or one step incisions. Yeah. See any, and looking at yeah, see if there's any change in integrity. Yeah, um, yeah. No, that would be a friend good. of mine is in the practice up in the Bay in the Pacific Northwest, high volume times, and as a group, their practice has decided that they will not do quick horn incisions unless the patient has glaucoma and they don't want to really? have any tire. Because of their rates, of just because of rates of antibiotics, huh. so they don't inject intracameral for antibiotics. Their rates are extremely low. Um, just just using small tunnel incisions. Thank you guys.